I'm starting the recording, so the recording is all good. All right, so we are going to start with uh, this is from the wrong class. Let me get to the right class. Oh, I need to move the uh, super note to the other window first. There we go. And then get this one to the projector. There we go. Um, is it doing it? Yep, it is. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so um, first thing first, you know, we are recording, by the way. Um, so first thing first, I am disclosing the histogram, you know, and score distribution of exam two, you know, just in case anyone is interested. Um, so you can kind of look at the curve. This is post adjustment, okay? And that's why some people got more than 4.0. Um, and this is the histogram of grade distribution. Six people did not uh, take part in exam two. So the F actually should have been a seven, which is all the way up here. But that's you know, including all the people who did not take the exam. And this is all based on people who actually took the exam because I was making photocopies of the exams and that's basically what it looks like. All right, um, so that's uh, just you know, statistics and interesting information. Um, so now we are back to talking about graphs and today we are going to talk about the A star algorithm and the assignment is out already for the A star algorithm. So when you scroll all the way down here, you see there's a new homework assignment, application of the A star algorithm. Um, the link to the template uh, spreadsheet is not there yet, okay, because we're going to make it today. All right, so we'll go back to take a look at the graph module, and this time we're going to talk about the A star algorithm. The A star algorithm, just like the Dijkstra, just like Dijkstra's algorithm, is an algorithm to find the shortest path between two vertices. This time it is between two, okay? In other words, you can have one starting point and one destination. That's all A star can handle, okay? Um, <clears throat> in addition to that restriction, the A star algorithm also makes use of what we call a heuristic function. A heuristic function, which is described here, has the domain being the Cartesian product of vertices across your vertices. In other words, we're trying to figure out, if I want to go from one vertex to another vertex, can you give me an estimate of how much it's going to cost me? But this is just an estimate, and it has to be a, an, uh, it cannot be an overestimate. It can be underestimating by a great deal, but it cannot overestimate, okay? So the idea of the A star algorithm can be best illustrated by a map, okay? So I'm going to go to maps.google.com. <clears throat> and then we're going to take a, we're going to zoom out. And it will say, you know, let's say we're, well, I guess the Sacramento is in the middle of the state. We can do that too. Okay, so we'll just take a look at Sacramento being the center. And I want to get to San Francisco, okay? So most of you know how to get there already, okay? But let's just say that we are looking at this from the perspective of a program. So we are starting from Sacramento, and the destination is San Francisco. The, ACE, the Dijkstra's algorithm is going to, um, it expands, the one that we deal with, expands from all the destinations. Um, in other words, it will start with San Francisco, and then it will expand and expand and expand until, you know, it you know, reaches the you know, Sacramento. So it works, okay? But it's also not really the best way to do things. Because if you look at you know, the radius, okay, if you look at this as a radius and you draw an arc around California, that's how much space it's going to explore before it decides, you know, oh, okay, I think you know, using Interstate 80 is the best way to get to Sacramento. In other words, it would also kind of go to you know, Santa Rosa, and then south, it's going to go to Monterey, and so on and so forth. It's like, why would you go to Monterey if you want to go from San Francisco to Sacramento? But the algorithm doesn't know. It would just kind of blindly explore, 
you know, around, you know, in a expanding radius. Is that okay? Okay. So this is what we call a breadth first search, which means it, it is trying to expand its boundary in a, you know, using a radius that is increasing. But then, you know, it would also explore things that it really does not need to explore. <clears throat> the A star algorithm, on the other hand, uses an estimate. In other words, uh, you have to give the A star algorithm a way to roughly estimate how far it is from a certain place to another place. Okay, so if we are talking about from Sacramento to San Francisco, the exact distance is eh, it's not a straight line. Okay, it does have some you know curves around it and so on and so forth. That's going to take some time to evaluate. So I'm going to say, well, since you know, we are <clears throat> living in three-dimensional space and this is on the surface, so if I were to plot a straight line from Sacramento to San Francisco, the length of that straight line is a very good underestimate of the actual distance. Does that make sense to you? Now, is it always going to be a you know good estimate? Not always. I mean, sometimes it's a gross underestimate simply because you know, all the rows have to go around a natural feature. Okay, that happens. But in most cases, it is a reasonable estimate, and it doesn't take a whole lot of time to calculate. It, this is something that we can compute really, really quickly. Is that okay so far? So that is the heuristic function. The heuristic function is something that is easy to compute, and it always gives you um, an estimate of the actual you know, distance, and it's always going to be, it, it will never give you an overestimate. You know, in other words, it, it's always going to be, most of the time, it's going to be under. It can be exactly the same, but it's never over. Is that okay? Does everybody understand the meaning of the heuristic function? <clears throat> okay. So with the use of the heuristic function, why does it help? Well, because even though it was trying to explore around Sacramento, it might even go to Elk Grove, okay? So it would say, okay, if I were to go from Sacramento through Elk Grove to San Francisco, you know, how far is that going to be? So it will first look at the actual distance that we have to travel from Sacramento to Elk Grove, and then it will estimate the distance between Elk Grove and San Francisco. So the sum of those two become an estimate of, if I were to go from Sacramento through Elk Grove to San Francisco, approximately how far do I have to travel? As opposed to going to from Sacramento, I know exactly how far it is away from Davis, and then I will estimate from Davis to San Francisco how far that's going to be. So which one do you think is preferred? Which one do you think is going to be a lower number? Sacramento through Elk Grove to San Francisco or Sacramento through Davis to San Francisco? Through Davis, right? So the algorithm would then evaluate that and go like, oh, okay, I guess I don't have to look at Elk Grove as an alternative anymore because Davis looks a lot better based on the estimate. Is that okay? So it would do the same thing with, you know, um, possibly Roseville, which is in the opposite direction. So it might go around Sacramento just a little bit to find if to see if there's a uh, a promising route. But if it goes to uh, Roseville, we'll find out the exact distance to Roseville. But then the estimate of distance from Roseville to San Francisco will basically say, uh-uh, that's not likely to be a good choice. So using the heuristic we now say okay we are not going to focus on you know expanding from roseville or Folsom. we'll we'll go ahead and give davis a try okay because that looks promising so that's how the heuristic is going to help the algorithm to explore options that are more likely to give it the best the shortest path are we still doing okay so far okay <clears throat> so that's the re the rationale behind the use of a heuristic function in the A star algorithm. So now we're going to go take a look at the actual algorithm itself. 
and try to find out you know how does it get the job done so we're going to do almost the same thing as last time we will first you know, take a look at the algorithm itself and then we're going to go you know uh, we have an example okay if the example is already in my tablet and then we'll trace it and then the result of the trace is something that you can also use in your homework assignment <clears throat> all right so here we go um so the a star algorithm is the only difference is two things one it has one starting point and one destination and the second one is we need a heuristic function in order for this to work. So what if you cannot find a heuristic function? Well, you can always define the heuristic function to be just zero, okay? In which case, the A star algorithm degenerates into Dijkstra's algorithm. So it will do the equal distance expansion and explore a lot of things that probably does not help, okay? But it's not gonna hurt it in the sense that it won't give you the long solution. It will just take longer to find the correct solution. All right, so we'll focus on the algorithm, okay? And as we talk about the algorithm, if you have any questions, you'll go ahead and you'll let me know. So we're gonna, I'm just using the cursor key to do the scrolling, okay? So once again, all the lets are either parameters, things that you're given with, or local variables that we need. So we start with the graph, which is described by the set of vertices and the set of edges. So that part has not changed. We also have a function d that maps edges to non-negative real numbers. That one has not changed either. <clears throat> this time we have a single vertex. You know, we will designate that one as s you know, in the set of vertices as our start vertex. We have a destination, which has, you know, which is represented by x. And on top of everything else, we have a heuristic function. The heuristic function is basically this. It will map uh, not edges, but it will actually map you know, the uh, this vertex pairs to a non-negative real number. Okay? So technically, this is how it is supposed to be defined. But in practice, we just need to know from a vertex to the destination. So all of the other ones are not really needed. Are there any questions about that statement? Because the algorithm only needs to find out the estimate of distance between any vertex and the destination. So that's why you know this second V here could have been just the set consisting of the destination. All right. <clears throat> So this is the beginning of the code, which starts with initialization. But this time we have two functions to initialize. There's a function called g, and there's a function called f. Um, for anything that is not the starting point, um, the g of v is going to be starting with an infinity, and f of v is also going to be infinity. So this takes a little bit of explanation. What exactly is g of v? G of V is the actual distance of the shortest known path from the start vertex to the vertex V. Okay, so we'll, we'll pause here and make sure everybody understands what G of V is representing. G of V is the length of the actual shortest path known up to a particular point of the algorithm from the start vertex to whatever that vertex V is. Is that okay so far? This initialization we get into here only if, if and only if V is not the starting point. In other words, we're looking at a vertex that is not the starting point, and we are asking without any exploration, okay, what is the length of the shortest path from the starting point to this vertex out here? Well, since I haven't done any exploration, I don't even know whether it's reachable or not. So that's why I put an infinity here to basically say, hmm, that's my best guess at this point, okay? It's infinity because I don't even know whether there is a path or not between the start and the vertex that we're looking at. Um, the, um, the else here is corresponding to the not equal to being false. So if the not equal to is false, that means it does equal to, which means in this case, V is S, okay, the starting point. 
Well, let me ask you this question. You are standing on the starting point, and I'm asking you, um, what is the distance from the starting point to where you're standing? What would be the answer? Zero, because you're already there, okay? So there's a good reason why it is initialized to zero, okay? So the G is the actual length of the shortest known path, always from the starting point to whatever the parameter is. Then what about F? Well, F is really just the same thing as G, except we are also adding H of VX. Okay, so look at this definition here. F of V is G of V plus H of VX. In other words, F of V is an estimate of the path starting from S, going through V, and then going to X. Is that okay? So f of v needs three points, okay? It is after the consideration of three points or three vertices. The start, the end, or the goal, that's the destination, and in between we have the, the, um, the waypoint of v. Okay, so it's an estimate. This part is exact, this part is an estimate. Is that okay so far? So that's what f of v is representing. So in the case when v is the starting point, then f of v is h of s x you know, by itself. s is the starting point, x is the destination, because in this case, uh, g of v would have been zero. So the definition that we used up here is still applicable here, except g of s is zero. So that's why you know, I don't even show it here in the, on the right-hand side of the assignment. So are we doing okay so far, all the way up to you know, where the mouse cursor is? So we get so far, kind of, okay. <clears throat> and then we have another function. You know, this basically takes the place of E prime. I could have used the same approach, but I'm using prev for previous. So this is how we can kind of backtrack our way to find the shortest path. So whenever we look at a vertex, we ask, hey, are you on the shortest path? And if you're on the shortest path, uh, who is before you? How do I, um, if you're here, where should I go as the previous vertex? Okay, so this gives me the ability to kind of backtrack from the destination. The idea is um, when we get to the destination, the destination will have a particular previous vertex, that one will also have a previous per vertex, and it will link all the way back up to the starting point of the entire problem. So that part will be clear when we you know, kind of look at the solution. But basically, pref is how we represent the solution. You know, through the prefs, we can find the actual shortest path when the algorithm completes. Question? Um, so w once we find the shortest path, the only thing we can start with is the destination. So then we ask the destination, how do we get to you? And then pref is going to say, oh, you got to me through vertex E. And then we go to vertex E and ask, how do we get to you? Oh, you get to me through vertex C. And then we go to vertex C and we ask the same question until we track all our way all the way back to the starting point. Mm -hmm. So in, in other words, it's a, it's a back pointer so that we can track the path or the linked list, so, so to speak, you know, using the last one that we discover, and then we can link our way back to the beginning. <clears throat> all right, so that's all initialization. In other words, this particular bullet point is all about how do we initialize everything that we need in order for the algorithm to work. And so is this one, the initialization, the, so the set O, is kind of the set, um, I think, Q in the case of Dijkstra's algorithm, but I call it O, you know, because, um, you know, otherwise, you know, it would look too much alike and people would start to confuse the two algorithms. But there's one major difference, because in this case, the set O starts with a starting point. In Dijkstra's algorithm, we start with a set of all the destinations, 
but in this case, we, st we start with the starting point of the entire thing. So the direction of exploration is opposite to, the, to Dijkstra's algorithm as we discussed on Monday. If you're also taking CISP 430 in the same semester, then you kind of have to do the switch in your head because I think Iraj uses um, a version of Dijkstra's algorithm that starts with a starting point, not the destination. So you kind of have to remember which class you're in <laughs> because even though they're both called Dijkstra's algorithm, the direction of exploration is opposite. All right, so the actual algorithm starts here. And you can see that just the condition of the while loop is a little bit involved, okay? This is not as simple as Dijkstra's algorithm where it just asks, hey, is Q empty? Because if Q is empty, I'm done, okay? Let's get out of the loop. So in this case, it is a quantified expression. So we'll take a look at this quantified expression and basically ask, what is the significance? What does this mean? So it is an existential quantifier. It says, do we have at least one element in the set O such that blah, blah, blah is true, okay? I need just at least one, okay? I don't need all of them to be like this, but at least one of them. I need the F value of this element in O to be less than the G value of the destination. Okay, hold on a second here. What exactly is G of X? Okay, first of all, what is the G of something? G of V is the length of the shortest known path. So it is exact, okay? It's not an estimate. It is the length of the shortest known, the known shortest path from the start to whatever that vertex is. Now, in this case, because whatever the quote unquote, whatever the vertex is, is the destination, that means the length of the shortest known path that we are looking for because X is the destination. Okay, then what is F? F is an estimated, is the length, estimated length of the shortest path from the start vertex through vertex V to the destination. So what does it mean when F of V is less than G of X? Yes, so that means it, we might still be able to find a shorter path, okay? Because g of x is not representing the length of the actual shortest path. It is the length of the shortest path discovered up to that point of running the algorithm. So when the f value of, of v is less than the g value of x, it means, hmm, we might be able to find a shorter path. Now, does it guarantee there's a shorter path? No, no, I can design the heuristic to be very misleading and just kind of cause the algorithm to keep exploring when there are no shorter paths anymore, okay? But there's a possibility, okay, that there may still be a shorter path. Are we kind of doing okay so far with this discussion? Okay. <clears throat> so when we get into the algorithm, then we have to choose one element from O in order to ex explore it. So this is kind of like you're choosing uh, the variable V out of Q in Dijkstra's algorithm, except the criteria is eh, similar, but not exactly the same. So we are choosing a particular element C from the set O such that blah, 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 this condition is true. So have we seen something like this? in Dijkstra's algorithm. The letters are all different, okay? But have we seen something of this structure in Dijkstra's algorithm? I think so. And can someone use your know, plain English to describe, this is a Dijkstra's algorithm up here. So can someone use plain English to describe to me, what was this again? We are choosing a vertex V so that I think it has something to do with a, a term that starts with M. And it has a relationship, it, it relates to infimum, 
in the discussion of time complexity? Hmm? Minimum, very good, excellent. So all we are really saying is find the vertex C in O so that it has the minimum F value compared to all of the other vertices in O. That's all we are trying to look for. Is that okay? Okay. So, okay, so that's mechanically what's happening with the algorithm. But what does it mean? You know, what, why are we doing this? Why are we looking for the element in O such that its F value is the least? Why are we doing this? What, what is it representing? So let's just say that we have uh, three you know, elements in O, okay? One has an F value of 20, one has an F value of 24, and one has an F value of 28, okay? So 20, 24, 28. Why are we picking the one with an L value, with an F value, excuse me, F value of 20? What is that 20 representing? The estimated length from the starting point through that vertex to the destination is 20. In other words, that looks the most promising out of the three. Does that make sense? So once again, this algorithm is also known as a greedy algorithm because of this. Okay, it looks at the it looks at the most promising candidate and say, okay, you look you look the most promising. We're going to explore this option first. So any algorithm that has that particular element is called a greedy algorithm. Okay, so once we have chosen C as a variable, we remove that from O which is something that we did with Q, between Q and V, okay? You know, I changed the names of the variables, but the idea is the same, okay? <clears throat> and then this time for each neighbor N of V, such that CN is in E, do the following. So we are doing about the same thing as Dijkstra's algorithm, except in Dijkstra's algorithm, we are looking at all the incoming edges to the vertex that we have chosen. This is looking at all the outgoing edges of the vertex that we have chosen, which is vertex C. Is that okay? Because it's looking at all the vertices that start with C and then end with some neighbor vertex N. So we're looking at all the outgoing vertices of C, and then we do some calculations. So this time I have a temporary variable called T, and it is going to store the sum of G of C and D of CN. Okay, what is that? Okay, what is that representing? Can someone tell me again what is G of C? It is the actual length of, no, from not from X, from S. Yeah, from the starting point, right? Okay, so G of C, is the length of the shortest path discovered up to this point from the start vertex to whatever this vertex C is, okay? And then what is D of CN? What, what is that representing? D is a function that tells you the distance of CN is an edge, right? So it is just a single edge CN. So when we add these two things together, what is T representing? Yes, it's the length of one of the paths, potentially one of the paths, right? So T is representing the length of one of the many paths, but this time it's going through C, okay? It is the length of a path from the start vertex through C to vertex N. Is that okay so far? Okay. So now we look at T and then we do a comparison. We're comparing that to G of N. What is G of N? Okay, I know it's kind of redundant because you know, G, the function G serves the same purpose across you know, all the vertices, but tell me what is G of N? Yep, 
the shortest distance of okay the length of the shortest path discovered up to this point from s to n very good okay so now we are asked we are basically saying okay i just you know, figure out another path okay the length of a path um from the starting point to vertex n and i'm comparing that to the length of the shortest path discovered up to this point and i'm saying hey if if the length of this new path that i just discovered is less than the length of the shortest path that i have discovered up to this point i got a bunch of stuff to do because guess what i just found a shorter path compared to the one that i have discovered up to this point is that okay so i think it's really important to understand the meaning of these comparisons and these statements and not just focusing on the mechanism of what we're doing in the algorithm why are we doing it that is i think more important okay so once we confirm that we have just discovered a shorter path then we got a bunch of stuff to update the first thing okay some of these ordering is not important so the first thing i do over here is i'm adding n the vertex n to the set o because guess what? N just got its G value updated, which means all the other things downstream from vertex N may potentially get a shorter path this time too. So I have to kind of put a note to myself, okay? This is leaving a note to myself. It's like, okay, remember to check out all the outgoing edges of N at some point in time, because that might you know, get me a shorter path from the start vertex to the destination. So that's what you know, O gets O union N is talking about. But I also have to remember, you know, how did I get here? I got here through vertex C because the edge that led us here is CN. So that means in order to get to N through the shortest path, I have to now update and go like, oh, in order to get to vertex N, we are getting through vertex C. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> And then we update a bunch of stuff, okay? G of N itself gets updated to T, okay? That's exactly what should happen because T is the length of the shorter path from the start vertex to vertex N, and G of N is supposed to be that also, but it's not because we had this comparison. It was not, so it's time to update it so that it is, okay? And then the last one is also important, okay? f of n is now updated to be g of n plus h of n x. So just, you know, I know most of you already know why we are doing this update, but f of n is representing the length, the estimated length of the path from the start vertex going through vertex n to vertex x. g of n is the actual length of the shortest path up to this point, from the start vertex to vertex n, h of nx is the length, is the estimated length of the path from vertex n to vertex x. So together, when you add these two, now you have an estimated length of the path from the start vertex through vertex n to the destination. So we store that into quote unquote f of n, so that you, I mean, the whole purpose of f of n is for this part and also for this part over here, okay? It's for us to prioritize which vertex should I pick up to explore, or is it time to get out of this algorithm? So after all these updates, you know, that concludes you know, what we need to do for the then portion of the conditional statement. And if there's nothing else to do for the for each loop, then we go all the way back to the while loop and, you know, try again. So one thing you might notice is this algorithm may exit, the while loop may exit when O is not empty. You might still have some elements in O, but the condition that we specify here turns out to be false. And in that case, we still want to get out of the loop. But what does it mean when the condition is false? What does it mean when, it, when we say it is not the case that at least one vertex B in the set O is le has a f value that is less than g of x. What does that mean? In other words, what does it mean when every vertex in O 
has a f value that is greater than or equal to g of x. What does that mean? When, okay, that's close, but that's that's good. It's a good starting point. Go ahead. Yep, and since we know the heuristics are not going to overestimate, so that means there's no hope. <laughs> it means there's no hope. There's not. We cannot possibly have a shorter path anymore, because all the candidates left over in the set O has estimated lengths of their shortest path you know, through the specific vertices. They're all greater than or equal to the length of the actual shortest path discovered up to this point. And so that means there's, there's no, there, there are no options left. So that's why you know, when the condition of the while loop is false, we can get out. Even though at that point O may be non-empty, but whatever is left in the set O Guarant are guaranteed to have a longer path. Is that okay? Go ahead. So that's the breeding part of the algorithm that we're looking at the estimate, and it just says it's bigger than the actual length. It's like the loop. Well, that's not the greedy part. The greedy part is how we choose which vertex out of O to explore. We find the one that has the least F value, the most promising one. So that is how the algorithm is called a greedy algorithm. It's actually a misnomer, as I said a little bit earlier in on Monday. It should should have been called the optimistic, you know, algorithm, not so much the greedy algorithm. There was another hand up. Yep, go ahead. Um, we can just leave them, you know, you know, because they will never be selected anyway, and by the time. I mean, I suppose you can get it out of O because it'll be more, it, it's useless at that point. Well, if you remove those from O, then you need to specify the logic to do it. And if you remove all the vertices in O such that the F value is greater than G of X, um, I'm just you know thinking whether that can yeah, once it's greater than, it cannot be less than or equal to anymore. So I think you can do that. But I have to really kind of go through the formal proof to know that, you know, this is this will still be correct. Yeah, but intuitively, it, it seems correct. All right. So when we get out of the loop, it means, you know, there cannot be any shorter path anymore. So at that point, we can define a new graph, you know, called GSX which has the you know, V, the same vertices, and then it has a new set of edges. The new set of edges is by backtracking from X. So what we do is we start with X, which is our destination, and then we ask, hey, who's your previous vertex? We go step one step you know, forward, or one step backward, I should say. We're closer to the starting point, and then we ask that vertex, it's like, okay, how did I get to you? Oh, you get to me through here. So as we follow those you know, back uh, edges, then we eventually will get back to the start vertex, and that becomes the shortest path. All right, so this is a little bit more complex compared to Dijkstra's algorithm, but the idea is very similar, okay? It's very similar. It is just that uh, which vertex we choose to explore is more informed by the heuristic. Are we good so far? Okay, all right. So we're gonna do, I'm gonna do the same thing that I did you know, on Monday, except you know, we are applying that to this particular algorithm. So I can do one of two things. I can kind of put it into the same spreadsheet and just add a new tab here. I think that makes sense, okay? So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I was actually experimenting with uh, a Google function, you know, to find the last defined value of a column so that, you know, we can actually see all of those values here so it's easier to kind of, you know, uh, evaluate things. And it wasn't working yet, okay? I was working on that during my office hour, and uh, so far it's not working. This is how you can define your own custom function in 
uh, Google App Script when you're dealing with Google Sheets. And I think it's great because you know, the programming language in um, Google Sheets is JavaScript. So why do you think JavaScript is a useful language to learn? In some way, it is more important than Python. Why is that? <clears throat> what can you use JavaScript for? This is one, okay? So if you're using Google Sheets or Google, um, what is the word processor? Doc, yeah, Google Doc. Um, it's Google Slide, which is the presentation program. So you can customize your, what you want to do using your own functions, okay? You can automate things. You can write your own extension, you know, to you know, Google Doc and so on and so forth. So that would be one reason. How, how, what else do you think makes use of JavaScript? Specifically that term JavaScript. <clears throat> hmm? So there are two applications. So when you're talking about web stuff, there are two applications of the programming language that you know as JavaScript. JavaScript, the term specifically refer to the client side. In other words, if you go to um, the developer option, which I think you can get to through F12, maybe not, I cannot remember. Yeah, there we go. So when you use F12, you can get to the developer you know, view of a web page. Uh, the code inside a web uh, page is all written in JavaScript. Okay, so if you want to do any type of automation that is on the browser side or the client side, you have to do it in JavaScript. On the server side, you can also use a relative of JavaScript called Node.js to write the code on the server side. So you have server side scripting, client side scripting, um, Google App Script, you know, they're all based on JavaScript. So that makes it a very practical you know, programming language to learn. Is it the best programming language? Probably not. But you know, it is a very versatile programming language that has a lot of application. Python is good too. Okay, Python is also you know, widely used, but not in the sense of Java. I mean, uh, Google App Script, nor um, you know, um, on the certain on the client side, you know, to automate certain things in the you know, you know on the web page itself. So you know, if you get a chance to learn JavaScript, take it because you know, it's a it's a really useful programming language. So I'm not going to spend too much time to debug this. Not today. You know, I'm going to fix it you know, maybe in later on. Okay. So we're going to add a sheet here. And this is going to be our, our trace for the A star algorithm. So now we have to say, okay, what do we have to keep track of? There's the set O. There's a variable C. There's a variable N. So C is, as a variable, is which vertex out of O are we choosing to explore? N is an outgoing neighbor. In other words, there is an edge CN to go from vertex C to vertex N. So these are the things that we need to track. There is a local variable T, okay, which is computing the length of the path from the start vertex through vertex C to vertex N. So that's variable T that we also have to track. And then we have the two functions, um, the function G on, and also the function F. So how many columns function G needs depends on the graph that we are dealing with. So this is going to be the graph you know, that we are dealing with here for the class. So we have uh, five vertices here. So that means I'm going to need five columns, A, B, C, D, E. And I'm going <clears> to <throat> shrink some of the columns that do not need to be too wide, okay, so just so that we can fit everything on the screen. And then we have function f, which is also a, b, c, d, e. And once again, you know, they are only representing an, a real number that is non-negative, so they don't need that much space. And then we have pref, okay, which is the previous vertex. So we have a, b, c, d, f, same a, b, c, d, e again. And each one only needs to be referring to a vertex. So once again, they don't need to be that wide. There we go. All right. T doesn't need to be super wide. Okay. We can kind of reduce the amount of space here. 
n is just a single vertex, doesn't need to be that wide. Uh, C is also the name of a single vertex, doesn't need to be very wide. So the only thing that can potentially take up a little bit more space is the set O. It is still not going to be very wide, but it will give it a little bit more space. All right, so not it's a little bit more complex. There are more columns to track, you know, but when it comes to the algorithm, it's not that much more complex or complicated. Um, and I'm going to use um, different colors to de designate here which one is the starter. I mean, that does, that's not needed, okay? So I'm going to scratch that. Okay, so the initialization of G is, um, which one is getting a zero again? The start vertex or the destination vertex? The start vertex, very good. So since in this graph, okay, so I have to tell you which one is the start vertex. So in this case, I'm gonna say, you know, vertex A is the start vertex. So let me get the tablet out and actually designate vertex A as the start vertex. Okay. And the destination is E. Okay. So now we switch back to the um, spreadsheet. This is the one that we need for the zero. Everything else is going to be infinity. As for f, you know, we have to add the heuristic function. So now when we go back to the diagram, we have to look a little bit closer because I have defined the heuristic value here. So I know most of you are asking, so why is the heuristic value from A to E four? Why is the heuristic value from B to E a zero? Well, that's because I want this you know, run of the algorithm to be somewhat interesting. So I can choose any value I want for the heuristic value, as long as one, they are non-negative, and two, they are not overestimating the length of the shortest path. So that means, as long as it does not take more, uh, as long as it does not take less than four units from A to E, you know, in using the, the shortest path, four is just a good value that, to use, just like any other value within that range. From zero, in this case, up to, what is the length of the shortest path from A to E? I mean, you can eyeball that and tell me. Come on, you guys can do this. Just eyeball it. Six, that's right. So any value inclusively between zero and six are possible values for me to use for H of A, E. I just chose four for no particular reason. Is that okay? All right. So, so now we have to go back to the previous uh, slide here. So this is going to be a six, a four, sorry, because it's the heuristic value. And everything else is still going to be infinity because you're adding the G value to the heuristic from each one to the destination. And pref is going to be unknown. So U N K for everyone, because you know we have no idea how the shortest path is going to look like. So these are all unknown to begin with. And then after that, the only additional re, uh, initialization is with a set O. It has to start with a start vertex. In this case, it is vertex A. So O starts with a single element of A in this case. So that completes the initialization. Do we have any questions? Okay, no questions. All right, <clears throat> so now we actually run the algorithm. Um, it's helpful if you have your own device, you know, whether it's your own tablet or the computer that is, uh, the school is providing is up to you, but it is helpful for you to be able to have one window to stay on the algorithm because it's harder for me to switch between. I mean, I can do that, but it's a little bit more, it's a little bit too busy, you know, from your perspective if I keep switching between the three screens. So it's helpful if you have the algorithm up on your screen so that you don't have to rely on me switching between the multiple screens. All right, so since I already know the algorithm, I can just go like, okay, let's evaluate the condition of the while loop. 
I need to know that at least one element in O, in this case, this just A, that so that its F value is less than the G value of the destination. The destination is vertex E. So we look up the G value of the destination E, it is infinity. And then we look up the F value of A, it is four. Is four less than infinity? Yep, okay, so we, so the condition of the loop is true. So we go into the body of the loop. The first thing we do in the body of the loop is to look at all the elements of O, and then we choose the one that has the least F value, which is kind of like a stupid question to ask here because we only have one element in O. So whatever it is, has got to be the one that I'm going to choose. Does that make sense? Okay. So we go like, okay, that's an easy one. We choose the vertex A, and now O is empty because we have to remember to take it out of you know, the set O. So it has two outgoing edges. Okay, so let me go to the, I can do the trick as last time. So I can take a snapshot here. Of This time I need to include the heuristic. So it's gonna take up a little bit more screen space than last time. Okay, we open it up in fair and keep this one on screen all the time, always on top, and the stash it all the way to one side. There we go, perfect. All right, so which one do you want me to explore first? We can go for A, I mean, excuse me, we can go for B or C. Which one do you want to go first? B, okay, C, okay. So we'll start with C. So if we start with C, what is going to be the T value? The T value is G of C plus the edge, uh, distance of the edge AC, excuse me, G of A plus D of AC in this case. So we know that G of A is a zero. So it's zero plus you know, five, because you know, the five is the distance of the edge from A to C, zero plus five is a five, okay? So T is a five here. The question is, is that less than G of C? So what is G of C? G of C is an infinity. Is five less than infinity? Yep, okay, we got a bunch of updates to do. So according to the algorithm, the first thing we do is we add you know, element vertex C into the set O. Um, and then the next thing we do is to update the previous, I think. Okay, so in order to get to C, we are coming from vertex A. And then we have to update you know, G. The G value of C is going to be 5, which is exactly what T is. And then we have to update the F value of C. So it is five plus the heuristic of from C to the destination. So when you look up the heuristic from C to the destination, it will be the H of CE, which is one, okay? So five plus one is a six. So we'll put a six here. So let me just explain you know, one more time you know, what these numbers actually are representing. This five is representing the length of the shortest known path up to this point from the start vertex to vertex C has a five, is five units, okay? The six on the other hand is saying, if you are to go, if I were to estimate the length of the shortest path from the start vertex going through vertex C to the destination, according to the heuristic function, it will cost you six units, okay? That's what these numbers are representing. Okay, it's important to kind of remember what each number is, what a number is representing, and not just to focus on purely just mechanically what are we doing. Okay, so that concludes you know, one iteration of the for each loop. Now we go for the next iteration of the for each loop, and we look at the other outgoing edge from A, which is from A to B. Same thing, we look at G of A plus the distance from A to B, which is one. So zero plus one is just a one here. And we notice that um, G of B is infinity. 
and t is one, one is less than infinity, that is true. So now we got a bunch of stuff to update also, just like last time. So we're gonna add vertex b to the set of O, then we update the previous of b, so that we say, okay, if we need to go to b, let's go to b from a. That's basically what that's representing. And then t is used to update g of b, so that's just one. And then over here, we have to say, what is one plus h of b e? And that's gonna be a zero, so that's just one. Is that okay? So mechanically speaking, it's a little bit boring, but you, know, you kind of have to remember why we are doing all of these updates and what each update is trying to remember. All right, so now we are back to the while loop. So the while loop says, okay, let's take a look at all the elements in the set O. Do we have at least one of them having an F value that is less than G of the destination? The destination is E, G of E is still infinity. Um, f of C and F of B are guaranteed to be not infinity because otherwise we wouldn't be if they would not be in the set O. So we know for sure that yes, okay, we need to do something. We are not, it's not time to exit the while loop yet. Okay, then what do we do? We have to choose one of them. Okay, choose one of B or C. We choose the one that has the smallest F value. So when you look at F of B, it is a one. F of C is a six. Ah, we're going to choose the one. Okay, or the, or the vertex that has an F value of one, which is C. So we choose C this time, and take it out of the set, and then we look at all the outgoing edges of C. So C has two outgoing edges. No, I got it wrong. I, I should have chosen B, because B is the one that has an F value of one. Okay, so. So I got this part wrong, sorry. There we go. And B has only one outgoing edge, which is going to vertex D. So now we have to compute you know, the value of T, which is, which is G of B plus the distance of the edge BD. All right, so let's check it out. G of B is one. The edge from B to D has a distance of two. So we have one plus two, which is three, so we put a three here, and then we ask, is that three less than g of d? Well, g of d at this point is infinity, so three is less than infinity, that is true, so we got a bunch of stuff to update. So the first thing is to add d to the set O, and then we update d, or the pref of d, so that we say, okay, to get to d, we are coming from b. And then we update g of d, so it is a three. And then we update f of d to be three plus zero, which is also a three. Um, it's a zero because I defined h of d e to be a zero, okay? Now we are done with that iteration, and this is the only outgoing edge, so now we go back to the while loop. So in the while loop, we are asking the same question. We look at all the elements in O, and we ask, does, is, is there at least one of these elements that has a F value that is less than the G value of the destination? The destination is E. So that hasn't changed. It's still infinity. So C and D both will have an F value that is less than the G value of E. We know that. Okay. So now we go into the algorithm, and then we say, okay, pick one. Which one has the smallest F value? So we have to look at f of c versus f of d. So f of c is six, f of d is a three, so we're gonna choose vertex d this time. And then we take it out of the set. And then vertex d has one single outgoing edge to e, which is the destination. But as far as the algorithm is concerned, being the destination, you know, our n being the destination, does not mean a single thing. It does not take that into consideration. There's no special consideration here, okay? So we now compute what is T, which is the G value of D, which is three, plus the heuristic between E and E. The heuristic between E and E has to be zero because it cannot be negative and it cannot overestimate. So the only choice 
is zero itself. Okay, so now we have um, um, what was I talking about? Right. Okay. So g of we don't need the heuristic value yet. Um, we are looking at t, right? So we have to compute t first, which is g of d, which is a uh, three plus the actual distance of the edge from d to e, which is a four. Three plus four is a seven. Oops, okay, seven in here. And then we compare seven to uh, g of e, which is infinity. It's seven less than infinity. Okay, so we have a bunch of stuff to update. So the first thing is, okay, let's put e into the set over here. And then we update the previous of e so that we remember, okay, according to this shortest path, we are coming to the destination from vertex d. And then we update you know, uh, g of e to be 7 because that's what t is. And then we update f of e to be 7 plus 0, which is also 7. Okay, so at this point, we have discovered a path from the start vertex to the destination already. The question is, is it the shortest one? Well, let's take a look. So now we go back to the beginning of the while loop. And at the beginning of the while loop, it is asking the question, look at the, in, look at the vertices in O. Is at least one of those vertices having an F value that is less than the G value of the destination? The g value of the destination is no longer infinity. It is now a 7. So the real question is, is f of c less than 7? So now we look up f of c. It is a 6. Okay. So it's not shorter by much, but it is shorter. So that means, yeah, I think there's a possibility that there is a shorter path. So we cannot terminate the while loop yet. Is that okay? All right, so now we go into the while loop. The first thing the while loop wants to do is to say, okay, if O has multiple elements, pick one, but you have to pick the one that has the smallest, the minimum F value. So we have C and E left here. C has a F value of six, and then E has a value, um, a F value of seven. So we are gonna pick the one you know, that has a smaller value, which is vertex C in this case. The fact that E is a destination has no special consideration in all of this logic, okay? So we pick C this time, and then C has a single edge, outgoing edge to E. So now we have to compute T. Um, T is G of C plus the distance from C to E. G of C is a five. And then the distance of CE is one, five plus one is a six. So now with this six, we have to compare that to G of E. Now G, we compare to G of E, not because we're comparing to the G of the destination, but it is because variable N has vertex E in it, okay? That is the reason why we compare to G of E. So we look at G of E, which is here, it is a seven. Six is less than seven is true. So we, once again, we got a bunch of stuff to update. The first thing we do is we are adding E. Okay, I forgot to take C out of the set, so I have to do that first. So we have to add E back to the set O, but it's already there, so it doesn't appear that we have, we have done anything. We update um, the pref of E, so this time it is coming in from C. This is actually a very important moment because we thought that we had a path. Well, it did, we did have a path. It's just not the shortest path. So when we discovered a shorter path, we update the prev of a particular vertex. It just so happens this is also the destination, but it may not be the destination. We update the previous to reflect that, hey, I found a shorter path to that particular vertex, and we update the previous of that vertex. And then we go back and update um, the G value, which is a six, which is because that's what uh, T is, variable T is. And then six plus zero is also just six. So we have all these updates here. 
that terminates the for each loop because C only has one single outgoing edge. No, it has two, by the way. Okay, never mind. I misread my own graph. It also has an outgoing edge to D. Okay, so we have to evaluate it. So now we compute G of C plus the distance of the edge CD. G of C is 5, and then the edge from C to D is 1. 5 plus 1 is also a 6. So in this case, it's also a 6 over here as T. The question is, did we just find a shorter path from the start vertex to vertex D? So we have to compare that to this code here. So we already had a path with a distance with a length of 3, and we discovered another path with a length of 6. Nah, it's not shorter. So there's no update whatsoever. We're done with that iteration, by the way. That terminates the for each loop, which then goes back to the beginning of the while loop. And then we look at the only element E here, okay? And you guys will say, oh, but that's the destination. We are all done. No, we don't consider the destination as any special vertex. We just ask, of all the vertices in O, is at least one of them having an F value that is less than the G value of the destination? This <coughs> happens to be the same thing, okay? Just happens. So we look at F of E. F of E is a six at this point, and then we compare that to G of the destination, which is also six. Is 6 less than 6? Nope. And since that is the only element left in O, we can now say, nope, there, there cannot be a shorter path anymore. And that's that terminates the while loop. All right. So how do we know what the shortest path is? You start with the destination in the pref. It says, go back to vertex C. Vertex C says, go back to vertex A. And then vertex A goes like, uh, since I'm the starting point, I don't have a previous, you're done. So the shortest path is from A to C to E. Are we doing okay with the trace of this algorithm? So it's a little bit more involved compared to Dijkstra's algorithm because Dijkstra's algorithm only has one L value to maintain. This one has two. Technically, they're not exactly two. The F value is not really necessary because the F value is always the G value plus the heuristic, and the heuristic is already given to you. But it's handy to have the F value you know, being maintained like this in the spreadsheet, so it's easier to compare, oh, who has the smallest F value, instead of, oh, let's go ahead and recompute the G plus the H value. So that's just, you know, it's kind of more of a convenience feature it's not 100% necessary to maintain the, G, the F value as their own columns, but it's handy. All right, do we have any questions about the A star algorithm? No questions, okay. So this is the A star algorithm. Um, It's an interesting algorithm because it makes use of heuristics. Um, a lot of problems in real world um, can benefit using a heuristic. Um, a lot of optimization problems you know, look like you know, a problem like this to find the shortest path. So can anyone imagine a problem other than a map, okay, where you have to find, quote unquote find the shortest path? Um, I'm particularly talking to people who have taken CISP 310, especially from me, because you know, those of you who took or who are taking CISP 310 from me, you should be, you know, you should know how to convert C code into assembly code. Now, how does that have anything to do with finding the shortest path? So let me ask you this question. Yes, go ahead. You, not so much the least number of instruction using the least amount of time. So there are different combination or different sequences of assembly instructions that can accomplish what you want to do in C or C++ or any high level language. Okay, the question is, 
of all these sequences that I can use, which one is the which one takes the least amount of time? Does that make sense? So it is finding the shortest path in a sense, where each vertex is representing an intermediate state of oh, if I perform this instruction, I will be here. If I perform this instruction, it will I'll be here, and so on. So you're looking at each arc, okay? Each edge is representing a instruction, and then each vertex is representing a state of the variables that you want to manipulate, that you want to update or compare or whatever you want to do. So the question is, I know in the C code, I'm starting here from the previous statement. I want to end up here, which is the next statement. How do I go from A to E, given that I have a bazillion ways of doing it, you know, because you know, in the Intel, uh, the AMD 64 architecture, there are more than a thousand instructions. <laughs> okay, so there has to be multiple paths, multiple sequences of these instructions that can accomplish the task. The question is, which way is the shortest? Okay, so you would think, oh, that cannot be too complicated. Well, okay, then you have to take into consideration of the actual architecture itself. So you look into an i7, and not just the i7, the i7 has multiple cores depending on how much money you pay, okay? Four cores, eight cores, and so on. And then you look at each core. And then each core has multiple ALUs and FPUs, okay? So I hope you guys still remember what is an ALU, especially if you're in CISP310 right now in one of my classes. ALU stands for arithmetic and logic unit. That's actually the, those are the actual components inside the processor that can perform addition, subtraction, and so on. But we also have FPUs, floating point units, okay? Those are specialized circuitries to compute, um, uh, to do calculations in double or single format, you know, the IEEE double precision floating point number format, and so on and so forth. And there are multiple of these, okay? So that means while the processor is using one ALU, to perform one particular add instruction, simultaneously, it can also use the other ALU to perform a subtraction, and this particular ALU to perform a comparison, and so on. It can perform all of those in parallel. So now the question is, can we reorder the sequencing of these instructions or utilize a different combination of instructions to make the most use of all the available ALUs and FPUs. That makes the shortest path problem a whole lot more complicated because you, know, you have to take into consideration of the concurrent use of the resources on the chip. Now, if you are a typical software person and you just trust GCC to do its job, you don't have to care about all of these things, right? You just say, here's my program, GCC-G-O, blah, 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 and it will compile it, okay? But what if you're the person who is writing the compiler? Then you have to kind of, you have to understand all of these things. So just a few more things. I know we are running out of time. Um, I do want to show you this because it is, it may be of interest to some of you. So if you do a man GCC, okay, or G, man G++, okay, I don't have those, but they have an option for optimization, okay? So I can actually see, go here, GCC optimization. There are multiple optimization options for compilers, um, and each one would do, you know, kind of special compiler, you know, stuff. Look at all of these options here. And I think these are all just applicable to, uh, oh, no, these are all optimization flags. So if you are the person writing the compiler, do you really need to understand the architecture well in order to generate the best code available you know, to whatever architecture that you're compiling to? So that means on one hand, this class is kind of like a math class, but the concept that you're learning in this class is applicable to something as low level as writing the back end of a compiler. 
And that turns out to be not a trivial problem because my roommate in graduate school, um, that was the only thing that he did was optimizing a compiler to generate code for not the AMD 64, that was the, uh, I think it was the Intel version of the 64-bit architecture back when Intel you know, first came up with a 64-bit architecture. And that turned out to be not trivial as a problem. So, you know, things are all connected, okay? That's the bottom line. Things are all connected. When you're, you're learning something, you kind of want to kind of think about how it can be applied to other things that you have already learned. All right, so I will send you guys, so this homework assignment is live already, and the um, template document is the one that I talked about today, which is the same as the one that you used for the Dijkstra, for Dijkstra's algorithm. So go ahead and start with the homework assignment, and once again, don't procrastinate. I will see you guys next week. Have a nice weekend, and I will probably send you the final exam from last semester too, so this way you can have a preview so that next week when we talk about it, you guys would have a better idea of what we are talking about. Alrighty, have a nice weekend. We're doing the final